This is Annabelle Gaberti and you are listening to Lawfully Creative, my chance to talk with professionals in the creative industries to hear their stories, what inspires their creation, what decisions change their careers, what relationships influence their work. So I am comfortably seated with Didi Zirat at the Prince de Galles Hotel in Paris, off the uh, Champs-Élysées Avenue, and it's really lovely. So you might hear some music from time to time. It's because we are in the courtyard. So let's get started with this second podcast of Lawfully Creative. And let me introduce you uh, my guest, Didier Zerat. Um, Didier is a talent manager, and in particular a music manager, and he's going to tell you more about that himself. And he's been active in the uh, music industry for... 30 years? Yeah. I was very surprised actually, did you? Because I googled you today, you know, I oh, put you your did. name on Google. Oops. I, I hope that's Oops. okay, you know, that's like the first uh, yep. first step. And I was really surprised because apart from your Twitter account, there is nothing about you on the internet. That's surprising. That's surprising because I, I, I google myself from time to time. I have about two pages, I have a website, I have a Facebook page, and I'm on Twitter. I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Um, I'm, I'm not very good at Facebook, I must, I must say. Great. So, yes indeed. So, what's your background exactly, um, work-wise? Um, at the moment, I understand that you are managing DZ Factory, which is a management yes. consultancy business, yes. and, and that you are also the president and the founder, founding member of AMA, the Alliance des Managers d'Artistes, yes. at AMA. Uh, France.com, uh, I believe. Yeah. And I'm actually a member of AMA. And in the past, you were also related to the IMMF, if I remember well. Do you and, I, I, and I still am. And I still am. I mean, quickly, quickly, my major, my, my, my background is is uh, major record companies. I've worked for BMG, EMI, and Warner's. In which uh, capacity were you I there? have been, I started as a, I mean, for, I started as a sales rep. Okay. Working for, for BMG in the uh, early 80s, actually when we launched uh, BMG in France. It was created uh, um, January 1st, uh, 1980. Okay. So I was a sales rep. Uh, I became a product manager, Arista, at a BMG. What's a product manager? Product manager is basically, you take care of, of a, a given number of artists. I, I, I was looking after, the, I mean the main catalogue was Arista Records and then there was a German one as well which was called uh, uh, Hansa Records. I mean as you know BMG is a German company. Right. Hansa was very important in Germany and um, so I was taking care of both Arista Records, uh, Hansa Records and then later on Jive, when Jive joined uh, Got distributed by BMG. Okay, so basically you were working for one of the largest independent publishers, BMG. I believe that you are bilingual in, in, in German, right? You are. I, I do speak German fluently. And so um, you were, as you were saying, a product manager for BMG for quite a few years. In, and, and then working out of Paris? I was in Paris. I was based in Paris. As a sales rep, I was based in eastern France. I mean, in Strasbourg, which is at the German border. Okay. And basically, I got the job because I was fluent in, in, in German, as, yeah. as funny as it might sound. I moved to Paris when I was promoted to position as a, a product manager, labor manager, product manager. Right. Um, I left BMG in 87 and started my own uh, own record company. Okay. And I distributed a, a, a label in Belgium called Le Disque du Crépuscule, which I loved very much. So what were you doing in your uh, own company? Um, my label. I oh, mean, it was I, a label, It sorry. was a label, it was a label. So you were so. going from publishing work in, into I mean, I've never worked for a publishing label. company. It's not a publishing company. BMG is not a publishing company. It has a publishing arm, oh, but nice. I was coming from the record company background. I ah. always had a record company background. Okay. And BMG, as a record company was set up in France in 1980, January 1st, 1980. Okay. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I've, I always thought that BMG was like mainly known as, a, as a, no, one of the no, largest no, no, independent no, no, publishers. No, 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 no. I mean, when, I mean, it's a long story, obviously. Uh, BMG as it is today, which is now called BMG Rights Management, mm -hmm. is a publishing company. But back in the days, but it was back in the day, it a was both a label and a publishing company. Okay. I mean, the the, the history, the history of BMG is very is, is actually very interesting. It's still a family-owned business. Okay. So it's a, it's a very interesting uh, uh, company. So basically, with that background, so how long did you stay at BMG then? Uh, all in all, for eight years. Okay. So with that background, with that eight years uh, of BMG experience under your belt. 
um, in the record uh, label branch, you decided to actually create your own business as yes. an independent label. Yes. That, that, that is quite a risky move, isn't uh, it? It was a risky move. It, it has always been a risky move uh, and was back then. I mean, it, it did last two years, basically. Uh, um, Licensing and distributing a catalog such as uh, Les Disques du Crépuscule was, uh, I mean, it was a fascinating experience. A music-wise, I mean, mm -hmm. I loved it, and uh, I produced the, my first record ever was produced while I was uh, working for Disques du Crépuscule. It lasted two years, what basically, eighty-seven, eighty-eight. Right. Okay, 97, 88. And so, what did you mean when you say you were licensing that catalog? Was that through? I was um, importing the records from Belgium and okay. placing, paying a licensing fee. It okay. was a licensing fee, okay. and uh, uh, I didn't sign properly artists to my label. The idea back then was to license labels that I was interested in, and Les uh, Disques which was one coming, crammed from Belgium as well, was uh, was very interesting. Uh, uh, I didn't make a deal with them. I was distributed at the time by a French company, which was very famous at the time for, and, and, and was really the French independent company, it was called New Rose. Uh -huh. New Rose. Patrick Maté, uh, they had a record store in, uh, in Saint-Germain-des-Prés and mm -hmm. they were label and very, very cool distribution system. It was really fun. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> okay, great. And so, um, when did you decide to uh, launch the DZ Factory? Oh, the DZ Factory, I launched it in uh, 2012, 2013, basically. Okay. So that's that's it's it's quite new. I mean, it's new. It's, it's three or four years old. Okay. Which I would, would yeah, I would call it quite recent. And would you um, say that it's a manage music management and music consultancy uh, business? It's a management company. It's I mean primarily management cons company and consultancy company consulting for the for the music industry. That's basically the idea at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Then, fact of the matter is the way the business is going and evolving, you have to be very flexible. Yeah. So it, it in between it turned also into a label. Okay. So it's now a label as well, and uh, so it's a management label and consulting firm. To the music industry, and if you have a look at the website, you'll see it's both the music industry and music industry investors. Music industry investors, what with the being, being, bas or being basically, providers or? being basically, I mean, something I found out over the years: lots of um, investment funds or investment companies are very always tempted to go into uh, the entertainment industry and, among others, into the uh, uh, music industry. So uh -huh. they have the financial resources. A pride people, I mean, no doubt, they have the financial resources, they have human resources, they have networks, they just don't know anything about the music industry as okay. such. My idea was to be of uh, uh, some assistance to VC or investment funds, basically trying to reach out to that community, US-based community, and help them acquire or merge into companies, into European-based companies. That is, then it's, it's be there from day one from any merger mm. and acquisition uh, uh, a move that they would make into Europe. Okay, for, from my background and uh, from also what I've read in the, in the press in recent years, I mean, that's not been a very successful endeavor um, to have uh, VCs in particular and private equity uh, funds investing in the music business because these guys are looking at a ROI of 18% per year and that my friend you definitely cannot I, I suppose you definitely cannot guarantee for um, a startup in the music business or a, I mean look at what happened with um, these are trying to to become listed on the on the public markets so they, they That's, had to actually I mean, withdraw the IPO proposal guess. well the IPO I mean but Spotify when, Spotify did the same they had to withdraw the IPO uh, yeah. okay well I mean that's interesting in the 19th century in France um, wealthy magnates uh, I mean wealthy businessmen used to have uh, what they uh, call they danseuse they uh, they dancer and that was a way of saying well they basically have a, uh, a girlfriend lady on the side a mistress and they just um, go to the um, opera to see her dancing um, a ballet um, um, in, in ballets and and uh, yeah and she's the mistress so I suppose, <laughs> do you think that's a bit like like that that they're not really looking for those wealthy uh, uh, wealthy finance guys of today they're not looking at making a return on their investments it's just because it looks good to actually have some investments in if you look at what, or if you look at what happened over the last 10 years and um, investment companies remember EMI was wow. purchased by uh, 
Terra Firma, if yeah, I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Hans from Terra Firma. Hans. That was a total uh, disaster. That, that, was... that was a total disaster. Again, but you have somebody who's bright, a very bright person. Again, financial resources, human resources, yeah. doesn't know anything about the business. Exactly. Buys the company goes uh, and goes bust because basically that's what happened with the uh, uh, with the uh, Terra Firma merger. Uh, look at what happens today. Access Industries bought uh, uh, acquired uh, Warners and now Deezer. Okay, so that's Access. Okay. Uh, uh, access is, Access is a fund. What is it? Is it, it, it is a Russian. It, it's an American Russian company. Uh huh. It's it's an investment fund. It's very very powerful. What did they make the money out of? Do you know Access? Ah, uh, the background. No, I don't no? know. Maybe usually. Uh, now. Yeah, no. Russian, it's, it's yeah. usually it's, um, natural energy, resources. Yeah, 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 energy, oil, maybe. That's interesting. Uh, okay. But you have to have a look at, at yeah. Access Industries. It's, it's, it's oh, yes, Glenn, Glenn, uh, Glenn Blatnavnik, or what's yeah. his name? What his name yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I see what you mean. Yeah. Blavatnik. Yeah. And uh, so basically, they, they and you, but you still have some, some investment funds in the US dedicated to the entertainment industry. It would be a mistake to think that the entertainment industry. Uh, uh, will not survive the crisis that we know because we've been through it for the past 10 years. It's going to be a booming industry. It's going to have healthy profits again. It's going to it's going to be happening one day or the other. It's going to be happening again. I'm not saying that's not the case, not uh, DJ. What I'm saying is that private equity guys, they expect to get 18% return on investment every year. Otherwise, they just ditch the investment. And that for creative industries is a very difficult goal to achieve because you can't really scale up a, a creative business as you can with a tech company where you can scale it up and just sell your the license to your software to billions of human beings and therefore you're going to make a fortune. But anyway, if you if you have an, an analysis, if you analyze major record companies, um, you had two kind of major record companies. Some were market share driven, some were profit driven. Mm -hmm. The market share driven ones were Universal and Sony Music. Both companies still surviving, still existing today. Profit-driven companies, uh, Warner's, for example. I did work for Warner's, and Warner's had a 18, 17 to 18 percent profit margin on uh, 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 while I was uh, working at, at uh, uh, Warner's. So uh, no, I, I mean it's it's feasible. 17, 18 percent profit margin is, is feasible. So you've been a, a, a music manager uh, for how long? Jim when Bates? I left Warner's in uh, 1997. So it's been what? 20 years? 97. Yes. Yeah. yeah, 20 years. Oh, right. Wonderful. God. So which bands or what type of bands have you been managing? I have always been managing up-and-coming artist development. Basically, that's what I'm, I'm focusing on. That's what I'm interested in. Okay. Uh, um, up-and-coming? Yeah. Yeah. Artist New team. apps. That's, that's even rougher. Edge that's of the probably the toughest. Music uh, management. That's probably business. the toughest area in, in, in music management. For yes. sure. I mean, it's already being a music manager is a tough job. It's a rough job. I became a, a talent manager myself. Um, uh, earlier this year, I noticed that a lot of music acts are just not wired like <laughs> music lawyers, so to speak, and you know, and and music executives, and that you need to talk to them in a very different way. And although I do have a lot of sympathy, and also I want to nurture, of course, this talent. At the end of the day, it needs to be about the bottom line, and that is something that a lot of acts find difficult to understand. It's not their world. No. It's not their world. It's not. It's. It's not the way they think. It's not the way they. It's. They're not driven by profit. They're not driven by business. They are driven by creativity. They are very creative people. And what you do need is somebody who is a bridge between the business world and the creative world. And that's exactly what the management, what the manager is all about. Yeah. The manager is explaining to the business side of the industry, the creative world, and is explaining the business uh, uh, side of the, the industry to the creative world. Yeah. So basically he's a bridge, he's trying to bridge both worlds, creative and uh, business. Yeah, I, th I think it's a tough balance to achieve though, because uh, you could end up being sandwiched between the two, you know, the creative side and, uh, and the business side. But um, I quite liked as well the uh, expression that uh, Ross Stone, Ron the uh, yeah. Ron Stone, apologies, the, uh, the manager that you interviewed at Medium 2015 uh -huh. coin, which is that basically you are the CEO of the artist or of a, of a band. It says it all. It says it all. You're yeah. the CEO. I mean, to, um, especially today. Today, artists are becoming brands and mm -hmm. are becoming industry. So all the strategies you apply to artists are brand strategies, and you're the CEO of the whole operation.
yeah, of, of a course, business, yeah. of a music business, fair enough. So on this note, actually, you, uh, aside from your music management and consultancy business, Desert Factory, you are quite involved on the Chassis standpoint, yeah. yeah. And so you've been involved as a treasurer of the IMMF. So can, would you please explain to us what IMMF is and what's the difference between MMF and IMMF? When, when, when I decided to become a manager in, in 1997, when I left Warner's, um, the first thing that struck me that really was became clear to me is that managers are very isolated. What? Because Managing, they work by themselves? Because they are they are by character, by nature, lone wolves, and because that's the structure of the business, you run your own, basically. Right. So the idea was how can we help managers to network and and especially considering the French situation to become more professional. So as I used to live in London and in, in How long in did the you UK, stay in London for? Five years. Oh, right. Five years. From when to when? You know, from uh, nineteen ninety 1990 to nineteen ninety five. Okay. I'm still based there in Paris, both. <laughs> so basically what happened is that you had a structure in the UK called the IMF. IMF, okay. It was called the IMF and we changed the name later on to MMF because the IMF is the International Monetary Fund as well. So, uh, okay. Um, you know, competing, well, with, competing against the International Monetary Fund was not, not a smart, good idea. No, was not the smartest move to make. So what does it stand for, MMF? So MMF was founded in the UK. Was, uh, it's, it's Music Management Forum? M music Manager Forum. So basically, so when I, when, I, when I decided to become a manager in France, the first thing I did was reach out to uh, the then IMM, IMF in the, uh, in the UK, explain to them that I wanted to set up a similar structure in France, ask them if I could use the name and if they would help me or assist me in setting up the same structure in France. And they gladly did so uh -huh. and happily did so. So you called it MMF France? So I, I, it was at the beginning we were called IMF as well. Okay. And in the year 2000 we decided to change the names to MMF, to Music Manager Forum. So same in the UK, same in France. Oh, so, okay, you didn't coin, you didn't add the, 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 the word France at the end to make a difference with the MMF UK? We did. We did add France at the, okay. end, at okay. the end, like we you have an MMF UK, you have an MMF France, okay. and now we have a, you have a few ones around the world. So tell, um, tell me more about that. So where are where is MMF now? It's, it seems to be uh, to have spread around the world. I mean, when I was at MAMA uh, earlier this year in October, and we there was a, um, a Meet the Managers workshop, uh, and um, I noticed that there were people coming even from like Canada and um, Argentina. Uh, who are managers and they have an MMF there. So, so basically what happened is the third one in the world was probably MMF uh, in Australia, was set up by Michael McMartin okay. uh, way back then. We had a meeting then in London, Michael McMartin, myself and, uh, myself and uh, uh, MMF UK, and we decided then to create an international music management forum, so, which turned out and to be the IMMF. IMMF okay. So basically the IMMF is the international umbrella organization uniting all the local and domestic national organizations okay. such as MMF UK, MMF France, MMF Australia. And then we have spread over all the, the whole world. We have now 22 associations or organizations worldwide wow. representing 42 countries. Okay. Why do we have less than uh, less organizations than countries? Because we have, for example, an MMF Latin America. Yeah, fair so MMF Latin America will go from Brazil to Argentina, Colombia, Bolivia, etc., etc. Fifteen countries, fifteen South American countries sure. are within MMF Latin America. We have set up one, for example, in Western Africa called mm -hmm. uh, uh, MMF West Africa, with Nigeria, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. And uh, um, we have now plans to open new subsidiaries and new organizations because we help those organization uh, uh, national. Uh, one will open in, in, in Africa, for example, in Burkina Faso. Wow. And in uh, Benin, one opened recently in Zimbabwe, and uh, we had one in South Africa. What about Nigeria and Ghana, which have a Ghana and economy? Ghana is already in MMF, MMF West Africa. Okay, is already included. Um, we will what about open South Africa. South Africa does exist for, okay. for quite some time. Uh, we are looking now, we are going to have one in Israel, one in Austria, one in Switzerland, and then we are going to have one soon open an organization in Russia, India, China, uh, which um, will help us be visible in almost all markets, but Japan, 
the Japanese market is a very particular market. It's 95% domestic artists and, and only 5% international. So it's a market on its own. So are you still involved with IMMF? And I am still MMF involved France? with with, uh, uh, with the IMMF. I am uh, a member of the board. I was a treasurer until two, uh, a year ago. Okay. And I stepped down a year ago after, after a, a, a two-year term uh, to focus on specific situation in France where MMF France has decided to leave the IMMF. Okay. So MMF France is no longer a, a, a member of, of the IMMF and I have set up a new structure called AMA, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the uh, Artist Managers Alliance or in French uh, Alliance des the Managers d'Artistes. So basically it, it fits both, both languages, French and, and English. And we and AMA now is the sole and unique representative of the IMMF in France. One thing about the French framework for managers uh, and in particular music managers has struck me as very odd you explained to me when we had this conversation i think around a year ago and i was thinking of in addition to being a music lawyer becoming also a talent manager you told me have you actually read that decree from 2011 <laughs> french decree from 2011 which basically regulates the whole management industry in france i was like what yeah and you also have to basically register your name on a list of managers, which is managed by the French Ministry of Culture, I was like, what is this? In the UK, for example, where, as I said, I spent quite a lot of time uh, for my legal practice, being like the, mu mu the management business is totally unregulated and you don't have to be licensed or you to be registered on a list, uh, which, by the way, has actually uh, been removed in Since December 2000. Yeah, yeah in, in exactly at the end of uh, last year, beginning of this. And yeah, because it was useless and, um, and, um, and also not, I don't think it was managed very well by the uh, uh, French ministry. So some of the, for example, some of the regulations in that French 2011 decree relate to the fact that the fees for managers, commissions are capped at maximum 10% and in certain cases 15%. If it's, you ten, actually, it's 10 plus 5, yes. Yeah, and also you need to uh, basically have a written contract, which of course I, I can understand, of course, this by law. How does this come about? Why does it need to be regulated? It's, it's for historical reasons. It's for historical reasons. I mean, uh, French artists have a, a very specific contractual situation. You have to understand that a French artist, when he's either recording or on stage, is an employee. And that the, uh, the concert promoter or the record producer is an employer. As yes. such, he's paying him a salary. Right. Historically speaking, you and by law it is forbidden to be paid or to take a fee from somebody's salary okay uh, 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 as a if you do some artist placements so let's 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 uh, so sorry that's what models agencies are doing on a daily basis i mean also in france uh, yeah but they have they have they have a very salary and they have a specific uh, uh status financial well. and status as well yeah. so that basically as an artist manager if you are looking to find a placement defined as a, 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 a position as an employee with a record company, with a record producer, or with a concert promoter, you cannot be paid a, a percentage of his incomes. It's forbidden by law. So, so basically... How do you get paid? So you... On what basis? The, 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 the agents, historically speaking, artist agents are an exception to the law and oh, they right. okay. and their status was regulated okay. since end of World War II oh. basically and their status was regulated and their income was regulated and basically limited to 15% which is basically what you have again today yeah. so you have a 10 plus 5 it's it's basically 15% yeah I'm not saying it's not market practice I'm like why does it have to be so regulated like then again we do believe that this status is is no longer valuable and we will do the best we can to get rid of this status. But but you do have the same situation in France. You have to understand to be a concert promoter, for example, it's a specific status, a license and well, you need yeah. to have a license as well. Yeah, even two sometimes, yeah. and even, yeah. even 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 three. Well, that, that, that is understandable one, because you, you can actually you know some people get killed at concerts if it's not been organized well. I mean, especially this year, there have been quite a lot of lawsuits in relation to either 
uh, musicians or members of the public who got killed or injured because like the whole roof collapsed or something didn't work in the structure. That would, so that, would be, that would be the responsibility of the venue owner, not necessarily of the concert promoter. Yeah, okay, not fair enough. But uh, I can understand why in this instance you would want to regulate because there are some lives at stake, uh, you see, as if you organize we, a concert. We would so. like to see I mean, the, the interesting evolution would be, A, to move this status, this French status, to another level, which could be interesting for all the, the uh, European artist manager, and that would be to turn the artist management, artist manager into a third party trusted partner as you have with a lawyer and or as you have with an accountant okay. and basically as you know lawyers have to follow some training yearly training and keep their knowledge up to date and we have to have a lot of, to do a lot of uh, degrees and uh, and uh, a lot of uh, university years as well to qualify we also have to so pass we, an exam we, we, which is complicated the bar we exam, would we so would welcome we would welcome to, to 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 force managers to have education and training to be kept updated on new technology evolution on legal on the on legal aspect because things are changing at a very very fast pace today. So, so before we go into this um yeah there was another question i wanted to ask you about the french framework on uh, managers why according to you what is the rationale of having forbidden to have the two statuses of a manager an agent as well as the status of film producer or record producer it's it's it, it i mean they were not targeting the music industry they were targeting yeah, the um, managers the, or the, no no i mean they were really targeting the movie industry more than our industry oh right right, right. basically yes, yeah. i mean that's where they were legislators they, yeah that's where where but but why this is why because they think that art, um, actors can be under the influence yes. of a film producer if he, also yeah. he or she is also managing their careers. Yes, so, so basically, and they did absolutely not take into consideration the fact that as, as um, the way our trade is, is now uh, evolving. evolving or turning into, yeah. uh, we produce videos. Exactly, we produce for clips videos or... for, for video clips, yeah. for et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the aspects that makes us and want to what change. What do you do? What do you do about we that? Because you must but, have but videos well, on YouTube and that. And often, I agree with you, it's being financed by the manager. But that's the, the label is not going to pay is, for this. This is where you manager. need an organization like AMA, like the Artist Managers Alliance. This is where you need an IMMF, because we do represent managers when we speak to uh, the Ministry of Culture or the Ministry of Labor in, in order to change the rules and the nature of the game. You think that French decree status framework, which really struck me because I don't think that this exists in other Western uh, Western countries uh, you think this is really quite outdated and not with its time it's completely outdated, completely outdated. Yeah. outdated. Okay. and it Thanks should be completely this. abolished uh, okay all right and so what you are saying is that you can't do good business as a manager or as an agent in france under this legal framework do you think this is not conducive to being able to be a successful manager or agent it doesn't give you it doesn't give you the flexibility to negotiate your incomes, your revenues. Okay, you're gonna say, okay, 10 plus five, 15% of the artist income is, is, is enough. Sometimes it can be even be too much. And sometimes it's too, le too little. Let me explain it to you. As I told you, I'm, I'm very focusing on artist development. If you take a young artist, up and coming act, and, and you work with them and you nurture the ads, you work a hell of a lot, and you would deserve to share the incomes 50 50. Wow. Okay? Do On the really? Yeah, that's my opinion. Okay. okay. And then if you take the artist to a level where it sells millions, you could reduce it to 5% or 3%. You know, but that you need to have a flexibility in your contract, you know, and in your agreement. Is, is it because you think that it should be based on the amount of work that you that you actually put into making the, well, uh, I mean, the success, the, uh, a career of the act of success, or yeah, what would related. be the? Uh, it's, yeah. it's obviously related. You yeah. know, I mean, working with young acts is it takes. I mean, you cannot work with more than two or three young acts. For sure, you know, yes. and it takes you at least two to three years before sometimes releasing or seeing a, a, a project 
coming to fruition. Yeah. So basically, the, the little incomes you get at that time, okay, yeah. sharing it 50-50 with the artist is not shocking to me. That's I'm not, not possible right now. Yeah. No, 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 it's not possible. It's not possible. No, no. I don't know. It, it, and it's not possible nowhere. Right, it's right, even right. not possible in the UK. Yeah. It's even not possible in the UK. Mm. Um, if but if tomorrow I take one of those acts up to a level where they why become, is it not possible in the UK since it's not in regulated? It's not regulated there because it's uh, uh, um, it's not market practice. You mean no? It's 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 not a matter of market practice. It was a a court decision. A court decision. It's a, it's a court decision. So there's that, some case law. Yeah, it's uh, there's some case law. It's a court decision that says that. An, an artist manager cannot make more than twenty percent. Really? Uh, uh, and and contracts should be should not be longer than three years. Okay. When was that published by the? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the late sixties. And if oh. I'm not mistaken, but that would need to be double checked. It's uh, David Bowie against his manager. At the How time. interesting! Do you know that actually I heard recently that Elvis Presley, his manager was taking 50% of his income, yeah. no questions asked. Yeah. That was probably in the 60s yeah. as well. Yeah. And the reason... Um, Colonel Parker was uh, 1955 to 19... Uh, starting 1955, yeah. so basically the mid-50s. Yeah, he was taking 50% of his income. And the reason why Elvis never toured internationally is because his manager didn't want to have to apply for a visa or something, or something really quite ridiculous. That's why he never had an international career outside the US. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is, you know, and if you take a, an act to a level where, where it, it becomes a Madonna or a Prince, yeah. or I would be comfortable with taking 3%. Of course, I would. Yeah, be. Uh, uh, let's let's check with Guy Osiri, who is our, our manager <laughs> from Maverick. <laughs> uh, next time, perhaps we actually met like two years ago. I think Medem, yes. Medem in, in so in Cannes, in the South of France. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. it was in Medem last uh, two, two years ago. Um, and actually, I just wanted to rein, uh, reinstate again the fact that you organize uh, basically panel with uh, with uh, Runstone, Runstone and, uh, and Emily, Emily White, White. Um, yeah. in Medem 2015, yeah. which oh, actually yeah. I, I attended, and which uh, video you. Can actually see on YouTube on, uh, on Medium's channel and also on your ama-france.com website. Yeah, and, and on my personal website as well. Okay. Yeah, or no LinkedIn page as well. Yeah. Okay. And um, I wanted to ask your point of view in relation to that because I go to Medium but I'm every year but I'm not getting what I used to get out of it now compared to two or three years ago. Also now we have MAMA in, uh, in, in Paris, which happens in every year in October. We have South by Southwest. Which, which trade shows and music business events do you think are must for a, uh, an exec or a manager in the music business to attend? DJ? I would make, I would make a difference between me, them and any other trade fair. Uh, Medium is a really international one. Historically speaking, it was the first one ever to exist. Started in 69 or something, 68, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the most international one. Then you have now an interesting trade fair almost every month. So you have two or three per month uh, worldwide. I would name, for example, The Great Escape in, in, in London. In, no, in, no, in the UK. In Brighton. It's in Brighton, Brighton excuse yeah. me. It's not, not in London, it's, it's in the UK. Yeah. You know, you have uh, uh, The Great Escape in the mm -hmm. UK. Uh, you have Ripperbahn in Germany, in Hamburg. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have Mama in France. You have two in Spain, uh, 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 in Barcelona and in uh, in uh, uh, the Basque region. Uh, you have some in Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, the Canadian Music Week. You have, I attended the GMA, the Golden Music Awards in Taiwan. No, okay, okay. Like, et cetera, et cetera. I, 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 get, I get the point, but you can't attend everything. So no, you can't attend everything. So the must, on it, the there, there is no must. There is, depending on the project you have and the territory that you are targeting as a priority, right. this is where you go. Oh, okay. uh, uh, Mama is an entrance to the French market, Ripperbahn to the German market. What, why would you go to Ripperbahn if you are not targeting Germany as one of your priority markets? If your priority Absolutely. markets are Italy, Spain and France, don't waste your time going to Germany or to England. Yeah. You know, attend the local trade fairs, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. And Very attend Medem because Medem would be the most international one. Yeah. Well, okay. so you think South by Southwest is not up there with Medem? South by Southwest is, is, is massive. Yeah, I know it's massive. It's, it's massive. like three weeks and it's film and music. And, and it's and, music and, and it's tech companies, etc. Yeah. Et Do you know how many concerts you have at, at the South by Southwest? No idea. 8,000. 
8,000. I heard you. Okay, well, over a three or four day period. Okay, so I mean, going to attending South by Southwest is a serious investment in terms of uh, time, energy, resources, finances. Mm -hmm. You don't go to South by Southwest like this. You go to South by Southwest because you have a real strategy to go into the uh, US market. Okay. And what you do then is you have to go six months before, you have, to, you have to talk to local companies, you have to start creating a buzz, and you have to follow up afterwards. Going to any of those trade fairs only for the sake of going is a waste of time and energy. Okay, that's a great piece of advice. Thank you. You know, as a music manager, what would you be looking for? Would you be looking for record labels for your young um, developing acts? Would you be re looking for publishers? I mean, whenever I go to meet them, I've got these guys who are, oh yeah, I'm looking for some catalogs. Everybody's looking for some catalogs now in uh, in meet them. Because, <laughs> you know, you just sit on your money and your catalog and you just <laughs> you just uh, get the, the cash probably from all the uh, royalties coming out of the uh, collecting societies and also the, uh, the DSPs. Uh, so, well, <laughs> so why would you go to uh, to be uh, a trade show? What, what, what are you looking for? What as, a, as, as a manager, basically, my primary job is to put a team around the artist I'm managing. Okay. So if I need a label, I'm going to look for a label. If I look, if, if I'm looking for a PR company label, publishing. But would you look for these there? Yeah. It, okay. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, I would. I, would, I wouldn't go there uh, uh, the box. You yeah. know. I mean, me them or any of those trade fairs are are, are places where you you finalize uh, or you initiate something, but. You, you have to go prepared. If I'm looking for a PR company in Germany, I'm going to approach 10 or, or 15 PR companies in Germany way before Ripper Barn, and okay. I'm going to make the deal at Ripper Barn. Okay. Right? Okay, but, but those are deal-making situations. I understand. Okay, fair, fair. I know that at MAMA, you, uh, MAMA, which happened back in uh, mid-October this year, you unveiled a survey and the results of the survey that you did uh, with your co-members at MAMA. Would you please tell us a bit more about that because the results uh, were quite concerning, quite di it showed a, quite a dire situation well, really. The, so. the, 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 the primary purpose of doing putting this survey together, which by the way surprisingly was the first survey ever uh, uh, organized on artist management in France, yeah. was for us as an artist management organization to know exactly what the needs of our member is. You know, it's very difficult to fight for somebody's needs if you don't, if you haven't identified them. So, so what that was, was the, the idea. How many people were in the sample that you, you know, that we you have sent it to, to? We sent it to 1,500 people how many and uh, a little bit around uh, 130, 140. Okay. But, uh, like ten percent uh, response rate. Well, okay. about ten percent response rate. Okay. So it was very interesting for us to be able to point the needs of our members. So what are the key points? What are the key takes takeouts from from this survey and the results, the outcome of that survey that you want to hey, pass on to our you, podcast? We listeners? mentioned it before: the status and the the need for us to have uh, to get rid of the status. Rid of uh, it or improve it. Get rid of it in the first, and you know, I mean, first day to me. <laughs> let's be anarchist, right? Yeah, let's yeah, be anarchist. Well, you know, let's you know, let's get rid of it. Um, number two, it was uh, very surprising uh, to see that basically, artist manager is a career that you embrace for a very short period of time, say between two and five years. That's because you best. don't make any money out of it in France. Because, it's, it? because it's very difficult to make some money out of it. I mean, what, what really struck me in, that, uh, in the results of that survey is that it's very po barely possible to leave out of your music management activities. It's very difficult to make a living out of uh, purely being a French manager, a manager in France, not a French manager, but a manager in France, uh, which is why we all have other activities next to it, then I'm, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, 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 a consultant. That's why you I also mentioned that there was a transfer of risk towards the manager entrepreneur. Would you like to expand on that? The evolution we see uh, that we have predicted uh, uh, is uh, that basically major record companies are signing less and less and less uh, artists when the offer is increasing and is be is becoming absolutely phenomenal. So basically, what the happens offer of what of talent of talents is okay. absolutely phenomenal. So that basically, what happens is that you have to, as a manager now produce the first record, produce the first wow. concert and, and become an entrepreneur, a 360 
degree entrepreneur in the music industry. And that's what we call a transfer of risk, be it entrepreneurial or financial, because fin financing the creativity is another very important issue for us. So you were saying at the end of your survey that you wanted to publish a white book. So what's the purpose of a white book and when do you t intend to uh, publish it? Um, that will be within the next six months. Uh, uh, this white book will uh, basically be a summary of what artist management is all about today, the practices, the legal status, the financing, and how do you fund such companies? Because we are entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs need to be funded. So that's going to be a very important uh, Funded? Okay. Do you want to How do you raise that? money? How do you raise money on oh. the financial markets okay. to fund your company? How do you do that? when considering the specificity of our uh, of our business to, we have to talk to bank managers we have to make clear to banks that you know that we are business driven and that we are entrepreneurs and so when do you intend to uh, publish this uh, white book within the next six months where, where, where is the the white book and the uh, results of a survey available on the net where can we find them it will be available on our network on, on our web www.amar france.com on uh -huh. AMA on, on the IMMF on my personal website and then we are going to send it to all the politicians in France members of parliaments politicians okay I think that's a great idea and I really look forward to uh, reading it it would be nice to have it released and serviced to everybody before the next elections I am Annabelle Gaberti and this is Lawfully Creative from Crefervy Studios